I'm thrilled to have as our representative of the future, Professor Susan Harris-Rimmer. So Susan is, is the future in many, many ways, but she's the very recently installed, I just have to get her splendid title, the director of the Griffith uh, University Policy Innovation Hub. And Sue is also the uh, co-convener of the Griffith Gender Equality Research Network, along with Sarah Davies. So uh, Sue is well known to many of us, uh, but I can claim her as uh, a dear colleague and friend from her time at the ANU, and we're very sorry that uh, we lost her up north, although we understand why she may well be there. So Sue is going to talk to us now about how can we move forward? So over to you, Sue. Hello, um, it's lovely to be here. I want to acknowledge that I'm here from the land of the Turrbal and Jagera people, never seated. And I want to preface our remarks by saying that first Australian wisdom and the words and wisdom of the current elders and future elders of First Nations Australians are so pivotal to these conversations that we're having about the future of the feminist movement and what comes next in the future for the Beijing Platform for Action. So one of the wonderful developments in international law is a stronger sense of the voice of Indigenous peoples through the Permanent Forum, but also some deeper recognition about the longest living culture in uh, this continent having much to offer current and future debates. So with those, I'm going to start thinking about the future. It was so amazingly interesting to hear about those who attended the Beijing conference. Um, I was a bit too young for the first Beijing conference, but um, I have been very jealous ever since of those who got to go and the young women who got to go. Um, but I want to think about some of the features of the Beijing conference that we want to take into the future. So these are the elements from the conversation this morning the level of planning and strategy at both the civil society and national levels around what should be the kinds of debates uh, are held and the kinds of strategies held at the Beijing conference. The split between the formal and the civil society space, very physically getting all the civil society people on buses and rounding them up to a more remote location tells us a lot about the need to protect civil society space in the future. The scale of Beijing. Uh, and the coming together of women from all over the globe is a very serious constituent part to it was a very large contingent of women. The fierceness of the advocacy and the creativity of the advocacy that Christine Chinkin told us about is very fascinating. Uh, it's clearly an ingredient that we need to hold on to, fierceness and creativity, and I'll come back to that. Finally, the very real battles that were had in getting some of the text in that non-binding uh, document that continue today. And finally, the idea that it was a holistic document, that it provided a platform for action, that it provided a kind of manifesto that the world had not yet seen on women's rights. So they're the features I want to talk about as we go into the future. So thinking about what the where we could go from here, as I have been tasked with for my 10 minutes, uh, I've been thinking about the feminist declaration that was issued in October this year in response to the political declaration on the Beijing anniversary that was discussed this morning in the chat, and also um, the young feminist priorities that have been uh, put forward as part of the generation equality movement. And here's some of the things they're interested in. And what you see is there's an alignment between the accountability measures from the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women as it's been extended by general comments, um, but also the 2030 agenda, including the binding indicators and criteria underneath the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, the National Action Plans on Women, Peace and Security that are now bound to CEDAW in, in terms of state reporting. So there's this, and of course, we also have the regional conventions that are becoming more and more important. So there is this layered accountability that's beginning to happen around some of their platform for action uh, issues. But it's still been quite piecemeal. And so what you get are very large gaps in the UN system as well around, say, economic rights and economic governance, for example, 
that I've noticed in the G20 and G7 agendas, although there's some progress there. So what did, what did the next generation of feminists see as their priorities? And they come back to what Carmen Lawrence was talking about, the neoliberal economic order and what it's doing to women's lives and the precarity of their economic lives and the injustice of their informal labour that is never recognised. All over the world, women work so hard and are so unrewarded um, in what the, the World Bank sort of euphemistically calls access to productive resources, which means women don't own land or inherit property or have access to credit or in any way control financial decisions often. So that's a lot, that's a large half of the feminist declaration and it's also number one on the young feminist priority list. And definitely we can see in the, in the academic literature too, we have a big blind spot around trade, international finance um, and so forth. And even basic things like getting gross domestic product changed or scrapped to actually encompass the world we live in and the value of women's work. The second priority is the climate crisis. And uh, I think, and I'm going to leave you with three action points at the end of my speech, and one of those will be around the climate crisis. But it's very clear that even in the climate advocacy uh, space, there's still a lot of male domination here, the scientific community, and not a lot of expression of feminist uh, methods to overcome some issues for the climate crisis. So those mitigation and adaptation debates are sorely missing feminist perspectives. They remind us the law reform project is not complete and that in so many countries and in so many ways, the law reform project remains partial. Um, and then it says, even where there is the law, it's not making a difference to ordinary women's lives, which Ramona just reminded of in those excellent papers sexual and reproductive rights and the rights of uh, sexual and gendered identities remains the most contentious areas of international law, as Anne-Marie has explained. We're still not where we need to be on our application of intersectionality, and it's got to get better <laughs> in the way that women's movements uh, are evolving and so many of Western into women's, Western women's organisations are being called out at the moment over their commitment to diversity in their own ranks. Technology is another area identified and particularly the future of work and what the changes in technology mean for the future of work. The future for women's human rights defenders around the globe, especially those who defend the environment and land, is an area of great concern and, and getting worse every day. And finally, militarism has only got worse uh, in the 25 years since Beijing and thinking of the ex exhaustive uh, money and talent that is spent on militarisation, including the ever-expanding defence budget in Australia, for example. So they're the kinds of issues uh, that the future feminists are talking about. And I suppose in my last little time, I want to think about three lessons that we could think about to be able to tackle those new areas. The first is that... I suppose for those of us sitting in Australia or in other, um, other uh, first world countries, the time has come to have serious conversations about yielding or sharing power, uh, acknowledging what your own power and privilege is and yielding or sharing it, voice, space, time. Um, and this is a journey that has got to accelerate um, so you've seen it modelled in this conference, uh, more established professors yielding space and time to more junior academics who have fabulous ideas and need the platform. Um, that, that is the type of modelling we need to see in all kinds of aspects of our careers and lives. We need to get faster. This is all about the year of the pivot. We need to accelerate. The climate crisis is not going to allow us the time for contemplation and kind of older strategic planning that we used to do in the feminist movement. We have to be faster at responding to the things that we need to deal with. And finally, we need to remain holistic and the idea of having manifestos and having targets and having very explicit goals, I think is something that I've taken from the Beijing Platform for Action. I love a good manifesto and I hope we can keep creating feminist manifestos to judge our progress. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Sue. I, I think your three points are very well taken. The acceleration is making me feel a little exhausted, <laughs> but maybe it's the time of year. Um, but I completely get your point. And having gone through the last weekend here in Sydney, 42 degrees where I live, you know, 46 degrees in outer Sydney, it, it's a climate crisis and it has gendered impacts and it has all other sorts of impacts and we do have to get very active on that. Um, but all your three points I think are very well taken and um, we love watching you and your amazing work that you're doing up there in, in Griffith and thank you for your leadership too over many years. Um, before I move on, I, I do want to also make um, a general comment here that um, not surprisingly we're getting a bit of a tr some trolling happening on our Twitter feed. Um, taking me back to Mary Beard. Some people don't like women taking up public space, including uh, on social media. So um, let me encourage you all to engage more directly on social media this afternoon. Um, let Take up that space, um, fight for women's rights in those um, social forums, and don't let's get drowned out or scared off by those who don't want us to raise our voices and be inclusive in our approaches.